Hey everybody, welcome to HackerCast. As you can see, uh, we did a disappearing Hawaiian trick, uh, and there is now Jeremiah hidden behind curtain number one or two, um, and so it's just Robert and I. Don't you have him in the closet back there? Is that where you're keeping him? Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, like we're going to find Jeremiah in Texas in the winter. Actually, he's in Germany in the winter, so that's worse. Um, <laughs> it's probably a bit colder there. Poor guy, he's got to wear shoes. Beer. <laughs> if only he drank beer. <laughs> exactly, what a waste of a trip. <laughs> anyway, uh, it was kind of a slow news week this week, so we just decided to roll with two of us instead of uh, rescheduling around Jeremiah's travel schedule. Um, so it's just us, so uh, let's just start. This one came in last minute, actually. Uh, right while we were compiling stories, I got this one uh, across my desk. And so this is a uh, IE11 uh, universal XSS and same origin policy bypass. Yeah, this is this is actually very similar to that demo I did uh, about click checking a while back, except um, instead of using a data colon, they're using JavaScript colon and uh, a couple other very minor changes. But basically what happens is they... They make you go to a different URL, and then they sort of have a reference to that URL in another frame, uh, and then they overwrite that with JavaScript, and for whatever reason, IE11 doesn't understand that you're still in the origin of whoever wrote it, not wherever you're writing it to, and so effectively gives you cross-domain, same origin uh, bypass. Universal isn't always a good thing. You know, Universal Remote's pretty cool. Universal cross-site scripting, much less cool. So for those who for those who don't have any idea what we're talking about, imagine I or attacker.com, you come to my website, don't really give a crap about it, sort of whatever, blase, maybe it's a retailer or something, and all of a sudden I can read everything on your bank or all of your uh, email on Gmail or whatever. I mean, it's just about the worst thing possible. And so the only re the only reason that's probably not as bad as it sounds is it does require an iframe, and so if you use XFrame options. Uh, which uh, is a op optional HTTP header that your bank and Gmail probably do use, uh, this exploit won't work. So with that one aside, it is probably one of the worst vulnerabilities on the Internet. Yeah, yeah. Uh, makes, me, makes me think of uh, my Chrome extension one from 2011. I was, I was popping, <laughs> popping JavaScript in a bunch of different tabs that didn't have any vulnerabilities in them. So that's, that's kind of the part that should sink home to everyone listening is... Uh, using this vulnerability in Internet Explorer, you can execute JavaScript in a website that does not have a cross-site scripting vulnerability in it. So your website is doing everything fine, can still be hacked via cross-site scripting. The users of your website can still be hacked via cross-site scripting. All right, cool, nice find. That was brand new. Uh, just hit full disclosure uh, today or yesterday, actually. So. Um, super cool. All right, so next, uh, we love talking about denial of service uh, on the podcast. So what would a hacker cast be without some cool new uh, denial of service attack? And uh, this one happens to do, uh, involve DNS, which I think you've done a few things about in the past, Robert. So yeah, I mean, Perhaps, perhaps. Wait, 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 hold on. <laughs> There's a third keyword that I always throw over to Robert, and this has to do with China. So uh, this uh, one company noticed um, that they were getting this massive amount of traffic coming in from China specifically. Um, and so what they realized is all the traffic was going to weird URLs. Uh, they weren't logging the host header, though. So they turned on logging for host header, and they realized that, indeed, all this traffic was actually destined to other websites. It just hap so happens that somebody uh, probably poisoned DNS. We're not exactly sure that tidbit, exactly how that happened. But effectively, that's what occurred. All of this DNS that was bound to you know, Google or Yahoo or whatever suddenly went to this one website, uh, and you got the full brunt of every HTTP connection from every user who, had, who the, this was affected by, which is a big chunk of China. So this is one of the largest DDoSs we've ever seen. Now, the reason why this is kind of interesting, I mean, so their, their solution was terrible, you know, block the IP addresses. I mean, that, that's just about the worst thing you could possibly do, because uh, long term, those people are going to start using proxies, and then when they use proxies, you'll have a much harder time blocking them. So anyway, uh, but this opens up a much bigger sort of question, which is uh, should we start investing in browser-based denial of service again? 
because really what you want to do is shut these people down from accessing your website uh, because they aren't accessing, accessing the website they want to be accessing anyway. Uh, they've been compromised, and this is a quick way to alert them to that fact. We don't really investigate browser-based denial service as sort of a protection mechanism, but maybe now we kind of have to. Um, pretty weird slash scary stuff, actually. That's a really good point. Yeah. Um, I mean, there's been some. There's been a ton of research with, uh, you know, um, that we we referenced in our million browser botnet research about the kinds of stuff that JavaScript can do out of a browser, and like just how many requests it can make per second. It's just nasty. So, mm -hmm. you do not need that many browsers to make a lot of noise. No, absolutely not. And you know, it's kind of funny they they took this tack. They didn't really have to. Uh, maybe it was a maybe it was a side effect of how they were doing the denial service. I'm not sure, but it seems like it would be more effective to have actually just taken over uh, DNS for some very popular JavaScript widgets or whatever and do more like you were doing in the JavaScript botnet. Um, maybe they couldn't. Maybe they had to do it sort of all or nothing. It's not clear exactly. Okay, so like we said, kind of slow news week. So the uh, third and final piece of news that made the cut that was uh, something we wanted to talk about real quick was... Uh, this one over from HackerOne. Uh, and so those of you not familiar with HackerOne, it is a kind of bug bounty as a service-ish. Like, they, they list and host a bunch of bug bounties uh, in one centralized location, and they're kind of the medium for the disclosure, and, you know, they kind of help with uh, paying out rewards. Uh, the other thing they do is they also host uh, bug bounties for the Internet at large. So, okay, maybe not a bug bounty for some company, but just bug bounty that... Um, would affect everyone. Oh, you broke SSL? Okay, cool, let's let's pay you out. And that is funded by a bunch of large companies who have a vested interest in this. So um, that's pretty cool. But then they also eat their own dog food and they run their own bug bounty for HackerOne.com, uh, right? So this is where this one comes in, and this is actually a really cool POC uh, of the vulnerability, and, and I really like this disclosure timeline because you can kind of see uh, how the bug hunter kind of goes through his thought process of, hey, I think I found this cool thing. Oh, wait, actually, it's kind of even cooler. Oh, wait, I can open redirect your website. So <laughs> uh, this this got pretty nasty pretty quick. So um, what the, uh, the researcher found was that uh, they weren't escaping uh, forward slashes properly. And we've used this technique for a long time in, in cross-site scripting now because uh, slashes are used to help uh, sanitize characters, especially in like a, if you're landing in like a JavaScript context. Uh, you can throw slashes in, in, in front of special characters and, and uh, JavaScript won't render them as, you know, actual code. So uh, one way to combat that, if it's not implemented properly, is to throw your own forward slashes in there and everything gets kind of confused and, you know, things get things get fired. So uh, that was that's what was going on um, in in HackerOne. And if you're interested in this, go, go uh, take a look at the link in the blog post and... And uh, you know we can, you can see at, at all the code, but uh, he at first he just throws some HTML in, like oh hey I, I can ex you know I can add HTML that's rendered properly on your site, <clears throat> yeah it's not cross site scripting, yeah you have CSP enabled, but I can still do some pretty nasty stuff. And then he goes oh wait I can actually put arbitrary profile pictures into someone's profile, oh, that's kind of <laughs> cool. Oh wait, I can change the style tags that might be used in some sort of defacement. Oh wait, serious exploits section of the bug. <laughs> now all of a sudden, uh, you know, you can start adding links in there, and then uh, the kind of creme de la creme at the end. After a few times, uh, you know, I think it was a few days go by, and he's posting comments as he uh, continues his research, and he can actually get a meta refresh tag in, uh, and, and what that allows him to do is immediately redirect the web page upon load um, to whatever web page he wants. So all the protections in the world, doesn't matter, be, I'm going to redirect you to this bad website. That'd be useful for like phishing, for instance. Phishing, <laughs> or you know, you wanted to execute JavaScript on your own website, you could do that, right? Mm -hmm. Hey, fire, you, you're now on my website, I control everything that I want to control if you come to my website, right? Malware and all that stuff. Yeah, malware sure. downloads, de-anonymize you, yeah. try to steal cookies, cross domain, whatever it is, I redirected you to my website. So just or, with HTML. Or, oh. uh, 
or an IE universal cross-site scripting exploit. <laughs> or an IE, if you're using IE11, a universal cross-site scripting website, and steal your cookies for any website. Exactly. <laughs> See, we put a nice bow on it. We introduced this really bad thing, <laughs> and now we introduced an avenue of attack at the, at the end of the podcast. So, uh, in Hacker One's defense, uh, being that this is what they do, <laughs> is handle disclosures, uh, they did really well. They, they closed it in, in about a day. Uh, they rewarded him $5,000 uh, and uh, disclosed it publicly about two hours before we recorded this. So awesome. a bunch of, bunch of brand new stories today. <laughs> Don't forget about the top ten. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, okay, uh, another link I'm going to post in the description of the YouTube and the blog post is uh, it is that time of year again. We're doing our top ten web hacks of 2014. Uh, myself and a coworker are doing this after Jeremiah has passed the torch on to us uh, two years ago. So uh, for those of you who don't know, the top ten is completely community-driven. We kind of source in all of the top new web hacking techniques of the year since it's like really hard to stay on top of all that research. Uh, and then it's completely community open uh, voting on the giant list. I think we got about 46 submissions this year, so it even topped last year on new techniques submitted to us. Uh, that community vote is going to whittle it down to a top 15. Um, and then that top 15 is going to be passed on to an expert panel uh, of, you know, the head of security of Adobe, uh, some guy from PayPal, you know, uh, security experts from across the, the industry that, um, that we're friends with and, and help out with this every year. And then that group of people is going to knock it down to 10, and it's going to be put in order. Right, and uh, whoever wins, you know, uh, and, top of web hack of the year gets a prize. So, and by the way, I, I sat on that panel once, and it's a ton of work. So ever since then, I always submit at least one, so I can say, oh, I can't because uh, <laughs> <laughs> I submitted one this year. Sorry. <laughs> well, the, the tricky part is you have to get into the top fifteen for that excuse to matter. Uh, and it, it hasn't like, happened. <laughs> you've gotten like three on the list this year, but if they don't get voted in the top fifteen. <laughs> You're voting on the panel. Yeah, this is really the hardest, the hardest talk I give all year because I have to become an expert in a lot of other experts' serious research. It takes a lot of preparation, but it, what it is is for us to give back and give kudos to the researchers and the community. And the talk, people always really like the talk because it's like TLDR, cliff notes of 10 really serious deep dive topics, and then if you are interested in any of them, you can go and kind of do your own digging on, on all of them. So um, I'll, make, I'll include the link. Please go vote on your top 15. Uh, uh, the voting will stay open for another week or two, so I'll, I'll probably mes uh, mention this one last time as a last call on next week's HackerCast. All right, guys, well, like, uh, subscribe, share, whatever you do. We're on iTunes now. You subscribe to the audio version of this on iTunes if you don't feel like listening to uh, on YouTube every week and uh, have it auto downloaded to your phone or whatever it is and yeah tell uh, tell your friends hugs and kisses <laughs> and wait can we just point out Robert's t-shirt before we sign off oh yeah this is uh, Sammy Kumkar uh, of MySpace Worm Infamy when he wrote the very first Warhol worm slash the very first JavaScript worm all at once uh, this uh, this guy made uh, Made history. So uh, Jeremiah and I have matching ones. Uh, the very first conference he ever spoke at, and we we uh, gave him big hugs with these things on. So <laughs> bed of hacker memorabilia. <laughs> Sammy is my hero. He is my hero. Yeah. All right, guys, have a good week. <laughs>